welcome to Mentality Meets. Conversations that explore mental health stories and strategies to help leaders like you change the culture of mental health in your workplace. I'm Peter Larkham, and today we're talking with the fantastic comedian and writer, Dave Chawner. Dave was diagnosed as severely clinically anorexic back in 2013. He went through two and a half years of therapy. And having made a full recovery, he now teaches comedy to others in order to help them. Today we chat about how mental health has a negative connection in our minds and how we need to talk more positively about mental health and why using comedy is so good for us. So here's my conversation with Dave Chawner. Uh, my name is Dave. Uh, I am um, so I, I uh, am a stand-up comic. I'm a presenter and an eating disorders campaigner, and I got involved in mental health because, as a sort of teenager, I developed anorexia and I didn't get treatment until my early twenties. And I had exceptional treatment and wonderful treatment on the NHS at the Maudsley Hospital in London for two and a half years. And now I kind of want to pay that forward to try and give some of those coping mechanisms to give some of those strategies and to give back a little bit of that wonderful help that I was lucky enough to get for free to other people that might be struggling you were saying kind of in your teens you got uh, you were suffering with anorexia and eating disorders and one of the things which kind of often strikes people when talking about eating disorders is kind of men and eating disorders and although the majority of people who are experiencing disorders statistically is females, there is a lot of men who are struggling with eating disorders as well. I mean, kind of body image and, and things like that. And I wanted to ask you, going back to before, so I, I, I think kind of you said uh, in your late teens, so let's kind of go 15, 16, 17, kind of before, before that part of your world kind of kicked in, if you were to go back and talk to yourself what would you talk about oh my good so not mental health related just anything well I, I suppose kind of is there a question of, that if you were to have this conversation would you change the direction like sliding doors would you be able to change the direction of your future would it have been that simple if somebody had come up to you and said hey Dave this is going to happen this is what you need to be aware of and this is how you access help I think there kind of is a slide indoors moment. And I think that's really interesting because I was speaking to mind about this recently. I don't know if anyone remembers, but I think it was like 2004. Stephen Fry did a brilliant documentary called Bipolar and Me. I think it was called Bipolar and Me. And it was just amazing. And I remember everyone in the... Um, Everyone in the playground was talking about mental health. That was the first time that anyone had talked about mental health. And me and my friend Sarah were like chatting about it. And I said, like, look, I, I actually really get a lot of the stuff that he was saying, like really get it. And she was like, me too. And I remember talking to my mom about it. And she said, you know, everyone gets sad now and then. Uh, and that's, you know, that's normal. And that was kind of like shut the door to that conversation and carried on. And I suppose if I was to say anything to my former self, it would be that, yeah, my mom is absolutely right that everyone does get sad now and then but that's a fundamental misunderstanding of mental health and emotions and I suppose what I wish that I could have told my younger self was that emotions are like the weather they'll change two or three times a day whereas your mental health is a lot like the climate it's the general background to everything so of course it's going to rain every now and then, but if it's always raining, if it's always wet, if it's always windy and cold, then nothing will grow. And that's the fundamental difference between emotions and mental health. And I really wish that someone had put it in like easy, understandable, breakdownable bits like that, that I could have said, right, do I think there's a problem with the climate rather than the weather in my head? What an amazing insight. No, I've never, I've never thought of it like that. But I think that's such a, a great way. I, I can remember supporting a, a teenager and, um, we reconnected and she's kind of now in her, in her thirties. So this is kind of how long I've been doing youth work for. And she said, Pete, you know what? If someone could just have told me that I'm the melancholic kid, you know, where my emotions are just fairly flatlined most of the time. Now that I'm kind of in my thirties, I kind of get it. I'm all right with it. But as a teenager, 
everyone else was kind of like all over the place with their emotions. And she was like, meh. And she thought there was something wrong with her because she was just that melancholic kid, you know? Um, and so kind of going back to kind of anorexia and, and men, uh, you came up with, you, you, you shared some fantastic statistics or some fantastic information. Uh, can you just kind of share the, the information that you gave about men and mental health and that it's not actually as new a thing as we thought it was? Oh, yeah, there's, there's shed loads of stuff like this. So the thing that really gets me is so there's three types of eating disorders. You've got anorexia, bulimia and what's called OSFED now, which is uh, uh, eating disorder, not otherwise specified. That's what it used to be called. I can't remember. Uh, otherwise diagnosed feeding and eating disorder. And uh, anorexia makes up about 10 percent. Bulimia makes up about 40 percent. And binge eating disorder or OSFED or whatever you want to call it takes up about 50 percent. Now, anorexia is the one that gets a lot of uh, focus um, because it is actually the uh, the mental health problem that has the highest mortality rate of any other mental illness. But what we were talking about earlier on is, you know, so people say that, you know, perhaps it's a, a female thing, but actually the first ever diagnosed anorexic was Richard Morton. It was a man. Uh, and that was actually back in 1604. And people like uh, Byron, had anorexia we very openly had anorexia he used to go down to i mean this is so byron-esque people didn't have scales back then so he used to go to a wine merchant in farrington and he would weigh himself two or three times a day there's like loads of stories of him wearing aaron woolies in the middle of summer to try and sweat things out and he only used to have vinegar and old biscuits um, so yeah, there's, you know, it's not a modern thing. It doesn't only apply to women. But the thing is that's really interesting that I find kind of uh, odd is that actually 50% of those eating disorders are like binge eating disorder or eating disorder not otherwise specified. And that's also a 50-50 split of men and women. So actually the largest majority of eating disorders are right middle, men and women. Whereas actually it's seen as quite a feminine thing to talk about. So uh, just on the chat bar, Melissa's kind of said, not sure if you said anything about this yet, uh, but Freddie Flintoff has a program out on Monday about his eight year story with bulimia. Um, and I love the fact that more people of a high profile, just kind of rather than kind of celebrities, because what is celebrity say to anyway, yeah, That's a whole other thing. But people are talking about it. They're talking about it more openly. Uh, and this was something else that you and I were talking about a little bit earlier is that the the media now are talking about mental health in a more positive way. It's not an immediate, oh, that bad things happened. Welcome to mental health. That must be mental health related. And we are on this fantastic move, aren't we? Where we are talking about mental health more. And that can only be positive, especially around eating disorders. And so I want to ask you this question, which is a bit of a, a, a personal question. So I, I apologize in advance. Um, but Dave, I want to ask. So. When I'm talking about mental health in the training that I do, I talk about it in the context of a common cold. Okay, so this whole continuum that we have a common cold and that we can get better and all of this. And yet when we talk about mental health, we kind of get a diagnosis of mental health illness and it seems to linger like a shadow that we can't seem to get away from. And in your bio that you kind of sent through, you kind of said, yeah, I struggled with anorexia got the diagnosis, got the help and support, and I'm now in a place of recovery. Now, we also talk about recovery not being diagnosis-free or symptom-free, but being able to have more good days than bad. But I wanted to ask, and this is a very kind of personal question to you, so sorry about that, but I wanted to ask, in the context of your recovery, would you say that actually this was a time of my life that is in the past and is not affecting me and who I am today? Or would you say that actually on a weekly basis, annual basis, daily basis, there's still something there that I have to be aware of, that I have to almost actively be pulling myself away from rather than allowing myself to get drawn back into? That's a really personal question, Dave. So, uh, no, it's fine. Uh, I like, I do look, I'd be lying if I didn't say that I uh, missed it because it was a disease coping mechanism. It kind of filled. Uh, a hole 
And in terms of the recovery thing, uh, someone, someone once said, I really loved, uh, someone said, yeah, are you recovered from the anorexia? And someone said to me uh, recently, they went, I like to think of it like I've retired from it. I kind of got to a level and I just took a step back, which I thought was brilliant. I do feel furthest away from the anorexia than I have been in years. But I think to answer your question head on, I think if recovery was anything, I think it's working with your brain rather than against it. And the brain is like the most powerful machine you'll ever have. But we never, when I was at school, were given any lessons on how to use it. And it's like the equivalent of giving a 15, 16 year old like a Bugatti Veyron and going, well, this does 0 to 150 in like 0.5 of a second crack on you know it's never gonna end well and I do feel like that was very much how it was with my own mental health and as I get older definitely not wiser but certainly uglier I do feel that I I'm working more with my brain and learning coping mechanisms instead of like trying to place it in a mold that it doesn't fit yeah Oh, I, I love that. And I, I really appreciate that. But Dave, another thing I wanted to ask you about is something which is really exciting. And it's a training process that you have put together. And I love it because if I could ever get trained to be a comedian, I would love to. So I might actually have to come and take part, uh, even though it might not necessarily be for me. But talk to us about what, what all that is about. You should do it, mate. Listen, you missed out on the training session, didn't you? That was, uh, we did a fake, we did a little one, a little pilot. I've got my top off. It's great fun. Um, so what I'm doing at the moment is, um, so I in, in lockdown, I think you can think about a lot of things. And one of the things that I've wanted to do for a long time is because I've always used comedy in order to talk about mental health and done that sensitively. There's certain things that you pick up, like, for example, joking around something is very different to joking about it and that sounds like a really semantic uh difference but it's a huge difference and what i mean by that is you can make jokes at the expense of someone or you can actually use that understand that and kind of further that knowledge process so i've come up with a six week comedy course that teaches stand up as a hobby to people with mental health difficulties and the reason that I'm doing that is because the skills used in stand-up are pretty much identical to the skills used in recovery that of uh, communication confidence and connection and in order to do that in order to help people because when I was in recovery when I had my therapy everyone talked about taking the anorexia away and it was my disease coping mechanism. So, of course, there was no way that I ever wanted to engage in treatment. Because what did I have to gain? Nothing. I had everything to lose. Whereas if you can say to people, here's an idea of actually giving something back in recovery rather than taking anything away, then that's more encouraging. Because people are positively led. People aren't negatively led. It's like those you know warnings that you have on the boxes of cigarettes it's a smoking can kill i've never known anyone to pick up a pack of fags and go oh my god smoking can kill why did no one tell me you know everybody knows that but there's that short-term enjoyment the nicotine hit the going outside etc but if you actually turn that around and said you know what like if you stop smoking, you'll be able to get up that flight of stairs. You'll be able to see your grandkids for longer. You'll be able to spend more money because I think a pack of 10 fags is about 10 or 20 grand. So I think that people are led by positivity. And that's why I think the comedy course could come in quite uniquely and sort of say, let's give something back and let's change the way that people see mental health as it being something fun and enjoyable and celebrating good mental health rather than constantly trying to avoid bad mental health is that a is that a kind of systemic i don't know if that's the right word um using bigger words and i know how to uh, explain them but is this something that is actually a massive cultural issue is that when we talk about mental health we predominantly talk about mental health issues or illnesses uh, and it's become so ingrained in our subconscious that it is uh, still not always, but a big chunk of it is still kind of taking us to that negativity. 
And I can remember with season one when we talked with Jeff McDonald, he was saying, actually, how do we promote the positives of mental health? And how do we kind of get to that place of actually, this is what mental health in all its fullness can can give you and can provide you. And it's not saying that mental health illnesses is a is a bad thing. It's actually saying, but but how do we support people to to refine that that positive place? Uh, and I think that's what I'm hearing, kind of in the context of your your comedy process, is actually to give people this message that even if they've experienced mental health illnesses in the past or mental health issues in the past, there is still a positive place to get to. Is that right? Completely. And there's a reason because one in four people has mental illness, but four in four people have mental health. But all teenagers switch off when they hear mental health, because if you Google physical health, you'll see sickeningly attractive people running in lycra or pictures of apples and stuff like that whereas if you google mental health you'll see these down and out depressives living in flats that are partially furnished with smashed windows clutching their heads and who's gonna want to ever read into that sort of crap so i think that's really important but i also think as well that there is a reason that we focus on the negativity and that's because there's this thing called negativity bias and that's because it's ingrained in us and it is systematic because if you had two headlines one which was you know uh, uh knife murderer still at large in your local area and another headline that was like I don't know, Cub Scouts going door to door selling biscuits. Which one are you going to read? Of course, you're going to read the one that will tell you that there is something, your life is at danger. So it's really hard to promote positive messages because people always want to look out. They're based on fear. But actually, that's where you try and sell people the benefits rather than the actual functions and say, enjoying this, like getting positive and getting having fun. Is a, is a beautiful thing. I did have a longer point, but I lost. I lost <laughs> <it>. <laughs> it was good. It was a really good point. I really liked it. I get. I do this thing where I get really ranty, and then like like a balloon, I start to deflate because I realise I got a lost along the way by a butterfly or a squirrel. It's very odd. Oh, I love it. I just kind of imagine that. Ooh. Oh, what was that? Oh, oh, sorry. Hang on. Uh, now, what were we talking say about? Say, I live in a zoo. I should have mentioned that <laughs> early on. That would have made a little more sense, wouldn't it? I'm so aware that kind of I've uh, so with mentality mix. I'm trying to learn kind of different ways of of recording the video. Uh, and today I've got it on speaker view, which means that if I make any noises, the, it comes back to me uh, as a video when you're talking. And the thing is that you're saying stuff that's making me laugh and I'm having to kind of mute my own laugh so as it doesn't kind of cut back to me kind of in absolute hysterics uh, as we go through this. But um, I love the fact because one of the titles, well, the title that I kind of put to this video uh, or to this time together is what is so funny about mental health and the fact that you are able to use comedy to help break the stigmas, raise the awareness and get people talking about it more, get people uh, more confident with their with their own mental health uh, and one of the things that came out in the in the chat bar a little bit further back uh, that I often find is do you get that kind of stage fight you know and with that how how do you kind of deal with it so for me um, before I do training because you kind of get all those jitters and noise and everything I eat because the thing is that I don't know whether or not I'm going to be able to eat at lunchtime because actually I could be talking with people and everything else like that so I I eat loads in the morning and then it basically kind of carries me all the way to, to dinner because I, I never quite know if I'm going to have any time. But it's a weird mindset because somebody else said, but hold on, uh, I can't eat <laughs> in that time because I feel so nauseous. And how do you deal with that? Kind of when you're, when you're in a place of kind of presenting and doing stuff like this, do you find that you have that physical process in the same way? Oh, mate. Well, this goes back to the point of like learning about your brain, isn't it? Because I always used to for a long time say that I, I didn't really get stage fright. I didn't get anxious because the stage fright I'd always seen was people biting their nails, shaking like a pooping dog and just wanting to get it over with. And actually, I didn't realize that anxiety manifests in different ways. And I realized that I do get anxious. I always, I never forget the first year that I ever did Edinburgh. I remember the stage manager always used to come up to me literally just before the show and just lock me in this massive hug because I got so hyper. I, I wasn't like nervous. I was just 
active about things that didn't really matter. Of like that chair slightly off center, is the spotlight in the right place? Is the microphone on the levels correct? Is the gain too high? And I kind of realized over a like period of years that actually that was just stage fright, but in a different flavor. And in terms of like how I've sort of, you know, combated that was firstly, uh, I think, you know, recognizing it and realizing it is always the first stage to it. But um, I think that actually one of the biggest things that I'm learning just in general is slowing down. Uh, in, in life in general has been really good and I think that's one of the few benefits actually of lockdown is slowing down Not everything has to be a mile a minute and in the training one of the things that I do is I give people hints and tips but one of the things I find really interesting now is that the more that I listen to people speak you only ever have fillers like the erms, the ahs, the er, uh, when people are speaking too fast. They are a direct result of speaking too fast because your brain is essentially buffering and thinking, what grout am I going to use to fill this hole? And with people like me, that comes out in swearsies, which is terrible when I'm doing the kids shows, right? But I do get nervous. And actually, the way that I've done that is to try and slow down. And that actually, one of the weirdest things is it does build confidence. Because if you're walking, I mean, this is another thing that you can see in people that are absolute dons. If ever you go to a comedy club, you don't see it on TV as much. But if you go to live comedy, the more seasoned the comic, generally, the slower they will walk to the microphone the slower they will be to say their first thing. And it is the psychological equivalent of a dog weeing on his territory. Because newer acts want to come out and go, hi guys, how are you doing? I uh, love me. I really like you. I've got loads of jokes. Are we gonna, uh, it's going to be good. Whereas like the more seasoned pros come out and they're like, yeah, we've got this. I, you know, I, I know I've got jokes in the old back pocket. I see what happens. And it is such a bewitching thing. So I think that, slowing down taking stock is is a really really important thing so yeah i think that's been my biggest thing that i've learned of late so one of the the comments that's come out on the chat bar says comedy helps because generating laughter helps us relief release endorphins and that makes us feel good so actually laughing is a really powerful tool if we feel kind of nervous we feel anxious and actually to just give us that time to listen into stuff uh, that makes us laugh or to think about stuff that makes us laugh. Um, and I love, I love comedy. And I always like to say that I use comedy when I deliver training. But to, to be honest, Dave, it, it makes me laugh more than I think it makes the audience laugh. So actually, <laughs> it's about kind of just me being happy on the inside. Is that allowed? Are you allowed to use jokes that just make you laugh, even if the audience absolutely dive on it? Of course you are, right? In the podcast culture, I worry that we're doing to comedy what we did to wine in the 1990s, right? Now, before the 1990s, people just used to enjoy wine. They'd have a bottle of Blue Nun or something from Lidl. And then you'd get people like Lloyd Grossman that would come and sort of wankify it and sort of say, oh, it tastes of puppies, farts and rainbows from unicorns. And I worry that we are doing the same with comedy, that there's getting this real comedy snobbery. Like, oh, my God, you like Michael McIntyre? Actually, I prefer his season, I'm sorry, and his only his early work. You know, I don't think that that is helpful. And actually, one of the things I want to speak to Lisa's point about releasing endorphins, I completely agree. And even taking that further, for people generally, one of the first diagnostic criteria that we see popping up with people with mental health difficulties is isolation and being filled in a room with people laughing around you at the same thing. It is a huge sense of shared unity, of a shared joke and i think that is amazing but i think to be honest and to your point the gold standard is to make yourself laugh that's brilliant i mean i'm i'm jealous of that you know i think that's, I, I will share a little joke and i this is why i don't like comedy snobbery but a, a couple of weeks ago i i still find this hilarious a couple of weeks ago a guy was selling a bike on ebay and he said it was a hundred quid or nearest offer someone below bear in mind was looking at buying that bike and they went 
how low will you go? And the guy who was selling it responded with about two miles an hour, otherwise you'll topple over. And I laughed at that for about an hour. And it's the worst, terrible joke. But just the retelling, the joy, the silliness of it is what good mental health is, I think. Sometimes it's the worst times in our lives that as we begin to retell it, it takes on a whole new level of comedy. You know, I was listening to a book uh, and it was that time that you went camping uh, and it didn't just rain, it chucked it down for days. Uh, It wasn't just like a puddle in your tent, it was a river flowing through your tent. Uh, Your sister wasn't just kind of uh, being sick, she was hurling chunks. You know, it's, it's all of a sudden in the retelling of sometimes the worst parts of our lives, there is a process of (sighs) redefining it into a a better story, a, a healthier place, uh, as you kind of look at these things. Um, and what I want to do is just in this last minute or so, can you just give us a, a bit of a roundup of how do we use comedy uh, for our own mental health? Great question. Well, p- putting on from your point earlier on, here's something that will keep you awake at night. Name a single sitcom where the main protagonists are happy, healthy, or successful, because I don't think it exists. And I think that actually using comedy in your day-to-day life is really important because it celebrates the underdog, it reframes any failure and makes it a potential success through laughter, through jokes, through anecdotes. But I suppose if you wanted um, a little... Okay, here's a little one that I still do. Back in 2006, I started writing a diary every single day. And it's been the best, one of the best things I think I've ever done. And I don't write it as a sort of, you know, Adrian Mole style way. I write it to be read. And that push to constantly think of what has been funny, what has been enjoyable, what has been silly about today changes your whole outlook on what your life is and you become the star of your own sitcom and that was dave chawner now i hope you laughed as much as i did so if you could speak to your younger self what would you say to yourself the key for me is that laughter is contagious and using comedy as a place of solidarity to combat loneliness and isolation is paramount So next week, I'm talking with Andy Bishop, who said to me, Pete, if you're standing on the edge, having those thoughts, what saves your life? Andy founded Man Gang to help show men it's not weak to speak, to break the stigma and find support. Please also leave us a review on the podcast as it really helps get the word out. The link is in the show notes. Thanks again for listening to Mentality Meets, conversations that explore mental health stories and strategies to help leaders like you change the culture of mental health in your workplace.